tonight on Primetime Politics, pushing back on China interference. On what date will we have a foreign influence registry? We have done more than ever previ any previous government. As the Prime Minister continues to get grilled on what he knew, opposition MPs continue to question his response to Beijing's election meddling. Is the Trudeau government moving quickly and strongly enough to secure Canadians from foreign interference? We will speak to a former RCMP deputy commissioner. Also, we will be joined by our party strategist tonight and talk about the political fighting over Chinese meddling. Will Trudeau have to acquiesce and finally call an independent inquiry to restore public trust? And... Chicken was at the right price in those stores. A day after grocery CEOs appear before committee, do members have a better idea of why the price of groceries are so high? Do they still believe that grocery chains are guilty of profiteering? This is Primetime Politics. Hello everyone, I'm Michael Serapio. The issue of Chinese meddling continues to be the central issue in Ottawa today. The Prime Minister triggering two closed-door investigations while avoiding pointed questions from the opposition. That includes this exchange inside the House of Commons today. Will the Prime Minister uh, commit to, refer to return any of the funds that the Liberal Party its local associations, his leadership campaign, or any Liberal nomination contestants received from the PRC? Yes or no? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. We have long known that polit uh, politicians across political parties, across levels of government, and around the world are targeted by foreign interference. This is a fact. Just yesterday, the 2023 Annual Threat Assessment of the U.S. Intelligent Community spoke of China's, quote, willingness to meddle in select election races that involved perceived anti-China politicians. So this is not a threat that Canada faces alone. We continue to work with our partners around the world. But at the same time, let me be clear that any suggestion that any member on either side of this House is not loyal to their constituents but a foreign government is not only dangerous, it undermines our democracy. Well, joining us now are Liberal strategist Richard Mahoney, Managing Director and Chair of the Advisory Board for the Macmillan Vantage Policy Group, Conservative strategist Tim Powers, Chair of SUMA Strategies, and NDP strategist Tom Parkin, who is Principal with Impact Strategies. Hello to the three of you. Hello, Mike. Hi there. Richard, I'm going to get you to start us off here. You know, the Trudeau government is taking a hit in the polls over foreign interference. How are individual Liberals feeling about the Prime Minister's handling of this issue? Well, I mean, I, I think, folks, it's a tough situation for any PM to be in. In this case, it's Prime Minister Trudeau. But in the in anything like this, you've got a situation where CSIS is leaking selective information. Yet as Prime Minister, you've got to be very, very cautious about revealing sources, methods, and all those things that go on. So you can't give a very satisfactory answer to say, this is what we know and here's when we know it. One, two, it's commonplace. He's not the first prime minister that has been briefed on foreign interference in elections, and he won't be the last. So, I mean, I, I think that most liberals saw what he did this week uh, with the appointment of uh, a special individual to overview it, the referral to the two co committees, one, an independent committee of the House that does these things and issued uh, one of the initial reports, or at least part of it, that's been leaked and the National Security Review Agency. So that's the right thing to do, because I think in the end, it doesn't matter what your politics are, whether you're a liberal or a conservative Democrat, you're gonna want the assurances that um, our uh, electoral systems and our elections are, um, while not immune from foreign interference, are fairly conducted and safe. And the problem I think with all these selective leaks is that it, it does, Pour, you know, uh, throw some question into that. So that's the challenge that he faces and the one he's facing this mm -hmm. week. Uh, well, Tim, I, I'll get you to jump in here because the Prime Minister has turned this over to CSIS and the Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians to review, uh, and as we heard from Richard, uh, point a rapporteur. These are mechanisms entrusted to protect Canadian security. Is the Conservative leader trying to score political points at the expense of national stability by not letting those bodies do their work first? Well, I think he's trying to score political points. That's a real shock, Michael, that uh, an opposition leader is trying to score political points. But I don't think Pierre Polyev's the threat here to Justin Trudeau. It's the P 
people who continue to leak memos which paint a picture of a prime minister who may or may not be telling the truth and that's the problem for him uh polyev were regardless of his um, intense partisanship or not has to point these things out he does have to manage where he goes so that this can't be turned around on him as the prime minister has tried through deflections about you know, uh, conservative MPs and Christian Anders, Christina Anderson. But the bigger challenge from the pro- for the prime minister is the ongoing leaking from the security apparatus and coming to understand why that matters, because it doesn't matter what he says. Every day, another story comes up that paints some co- sort of contradictory picture is another day he's on his back heels. Now, Tom, we've seen the uh, NDP leader essentially say a pox on both those houses. Uh, which do you find more troubling right now, the, the prime minister's actions or inaction or the conservative leader's criticisms? Well, Mr. Trudeau has got to be the, the one to be held accountable. He's the prime minister. And we have disturbing news stories that we read in the newspaper that uh, talk about activities that are of foreign government against our democracy, and those are unsettling. Um, We see Mr. Trudeau evade these things. Now, in terms of partisanship, it seems to me the right thing to do is what most, you know, uh, many, many people have said, including some liberals, including past Liberal cabinet minister Jane Philpott, let's just have that uh, proper inquiry, a nonpartisan inquiry, that uh, has the tools to subpoena and uh, can go in camera when necessary for security reasons, do all those sort of things, and do the proper fact-finding of what went on so that Canadians can be assured, putting it it, it out of uh, the hands of politicians. But, see, Mr. Trudeau has not done that, and that is why uh, this continues to be a partisan issue. It's it's within the reach of Mm -hmm. Mr. Trudeau to make this into a nonpartisan issue, but he chooses not to. You know, I'm going to get... uh, yeah. That's, that's Mr. Polyab is going to keep going in his direction uh, as long as Mr. Trudeau lets him. Well, listen, I'm going to get back to, to this idea of the independent inquiry. But, you know, Richard Pierre Polyev has asked the prime minister some very direct questions, asking whether anyone in the Liberal Party, caucus or cabinet received money from the Chinese Communist Party. The prime minister did not answer those questions. Why not? Will avoidance really further the Liberal cause here? So I, I think... You know, you, you sort of put your finger on it there, Michael. The, the the issue is, yes, he's being cautious. Any prime minister in that situation would sort of have to be, given the security implications of this. Like I said, this is not new interference in our election. We've had reports on it before, and we'll have reports on it again. Um, I think he's being cautious. Some, as you suggested, may be overly cautious in what he says at this point. But two things this will this will the rapporteur's pub, uh, report will be public he or she may recommend uh, a, an inquiry um you saw in front of the parliamentary committee this week when the security heads come to they didn't really tell us anything for the same reasons that i've been suggesting here which is it's their position that they can't so um that that's why he took the double step over the referring to the national security review agency the national security committee and the rapporteur. Um, yes, it would be easier if um, uh, if the prime minister could just be categorical about these things. But I think he's being cautious because the exact extent of what uh, uh, Chinese uh, government operatives on the ground may have done is unknown to him and to many people, I suspect. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, the prime minister has not ruled out a public inquiry, if that's what the rapporteur no. thinks is necessary. He says he's open to it. But you know, Tim, what if the rapporteur doesn't think it's necessary? What will conservatives do then? Well, I suspect they'll still call for a public inquiry and they'll still continue to put pressure here. Uh, there's no political loss in doing that for them. A lot will depend, Michael, on who the rapporteur is and whether that person has truly seen to be imminent and, and, and free of partisanship. But just just back quickly to something Richard said, there are questions the prime minister can say yes or no to. Uh, some of those questions involve uh, the ones he was asked yesterday around, did he see a memo? Did he not see a memo? challenge for the prime minister is not national security and saying yes or no to those questions it's competency because if he did see a memo and didn't act well how come and if he didn't see a memo why not so that's why he's also being evasive to use tom's word there so none of this still is helping him and the national security blanket will take him so far but it alone will not keep him warm at night
Okay, let's get back to the public inquiry, though. And Tom, I'll get you in on this. What if the rapporteur says a public inquiry is not necessary? Yeah, well, you know, I, I, I don't know. Uh, what, it, it very much depends on who this person is um, who gives uh, credibility to this possible report. Uh, and it, but it comes right back to, you know, do we not want to get to the bottom of this? Uh, is, it, is it not clear that this is exactly the kind of situation where an inquiry is called for? I, I don't understand this double process and throwing the blanket over it uh, by sending it all off to the National Security Intelligence Committee of uh, parliamentarians, um, you, you know, rather than just tackle it and this reluctance to just deal with this thing head on and, and take the blows that will come. Uh, because he's, you know, if there are, uh, if there is accountability for the prime minister in making bad choices, um, we deserve to know that. Uh, we deserve to be protected from that. And so, if that's the situation, uh, that needs to come out. And that's not partisan of the opposition. It, to the degree that there's a blanket being thrown over it, it's partisan of Mr. Trudeau. And the degree to which people become worried uh, about our democracy. It really is on Mr. Trudeau's head at this point to, to be absolutely as clear, as clear, as clear can be that nothing will stand in the way of fact-finding and the truth. And, and he's not being like that at all. Well, of course, uh, we'll be watching, as will Canadians right across the country. Uh, Richard, Tim, and Tom, thank you very much for the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Meanwhile, the issue of Chinese interference continues to be examined by Parliament's Procedure and House Affairs Committee. But today, proceedings took a turn when Conservative MP Michael Cooper asked a question of the Foreign Affairs Minister, Melanie Jolie. You've talked tough. Uh, you've talked tough with your uh, Beijing counterparts, so you say. Uh, you even stared into his eyes. I'm sure he was very intimidated. Uh, and now we, we learned... Today, and now we learned today or yesterday in the Globe and Mail very conveniently that a visa was not, uh, was denied of a, uh, a, a diplomat who wanted to work at the Canadian uh, Beijing Embassy. Uh, one visa? Is that it? One visa? How many visas have been denied? Just one? So I want to comment on your question and particularly the beginning because I think it's actually you, you, Madam, you know, Madam, the Madam, um, I, I, I'm going to pause time. I'm pausing time. I'm pausing time. Our approach here is very important. So I would just say be mindful. Mr. Cooper, earlier one of your colleagues had said we want to make sure well, how much time we speak, the response is given. You spoke for 43 seconds. The minister will be given close to the same time. You are at 10 seconds already done. Minister. Thank you. Well, Mr. Cooper, you would know China because you went to China as a parliamentarian in the past. And so, therefore, I think you would understand that when we fall into too much, um, t too, too much partisanship, we're falling into China's trap. Minutes later, Cooper was called out by two other members of the committee who wanted him to apologize for how he asked his question of the foreign minister. The constant demeaning nature that only occurs to our female minister that appeared today. Yesterday, it was another member of our team asking a question in QP, and a conservative member said she deserved a participation medal. Today, it was a question of whether this minister is tough enough. Every single day, we sit in this house as women, and we hear these, uh, they're called microaggressions, but they don't feel very micro, to continuously be undermined. This is so concerning because women across this country who are considering politics already have challenges. How many times have we talked about how women are treated significantly different than men politicians? For that member to sit in that role and ask a minister of our government that question was completely unacceptable, it was completely sexist, and he should apologize. We'll continue to follow that part of the story, but for now, to discuss the security of Canadians in regards to foreign interference, we're joined by Pierre-Yves Baudois, a former Deputy RCMP Commissioner and these days the President of PY Public Safety Management. Mr. Baudois, good to see you again. 
Always a pleasure, Michael. Now, we got word today the committee that oversees national security has started to look into foreign interference in the election process. Uh, this, of course, follows the Prime Minister's directive to do so. Uh, I wonder, do mm -hmm. you think this is the right mechanism to investigate the matter? Because if the big questions are what the Prime Minister knew and how he responded to it, this is not a parliamentary committee. This is, in fact, almost an executive committee. Correct. Uh, but if you recall uh, the comments by uh, David Vigneault, who's the director of, uh, of the uh, of CSIS, uh in front of the parliamentary committee a couple of weeks ago, he clearly indicated that they'd much rather be able to pursue and continue uh, the investigations as opposed to uh, having an open uh, discussion, a forum discussion, whereas uh, some of the investigation uh, and some of the investigative techniques that are used by the Canadian authorities in order to determine whether or not there's been political interference, uh, then if it becomes public, it could potentially assist foreign government in better understanding how they can avoid detection in our country. Mm -hmm. So some security concerns being raised. But, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, the, the, the many reports, most recently the one that came out yesterday that says uh, there were reports yeah. prepared for the prime minister and the government about the issue. And this committee of parliamentarians reportedly told the PM back in 2019 that he had to do better to respond to foreign interference. So if those warnings, if those reports were not heated, and we don't know that for a fact, but if they were not heated, yep. what makes us think that we can trust this time around that a review will actually be listened to? Well, it's, uh, it's uh, questions that uh, elected official needs to, to manage amongst themselves. But as a, a public safety issue, um, I'd, I'd much rather see uh, the Canadian authorities continuing to investigate and, and and report uh, and and the dissemination of this particular report would be up to the elected officials to determine who should have access and if if some part of the report needs to be made public, then uh, it should be. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, as you and I are speaking, uh, as you know very well, the RCMP have begun uh, their investigations into so-called uh, Chinese police stations in the greater Montreal area. Uh, couple that yeah. with what we're now talking about in terms of election interference. What does that say to you about how far the federal government has to go to weed out foreign interference in this country? Uh, the, the federal government needs to take this threat very seriously. If you'd recall in 2013, uh, Richard Fadden, who at the time was the director of CSIS, clearly indicated that CSIS was focused on um, uh, foreign interference in uh, uh, of all areas, also our elected and elections uh, uh, process. So therefore, that was flagged in 2013. There were other uh, reports that were tabled. And uh, this is, in my opinion, uh, and old uh, stories that are getting more traction, which I welcome, but you also need to uh, be fully cognizant of the fact that uh, our uh, authorities, either by, by the RCMP or CSIS, our Canadian authorities are certainly paying close attention to this particular uh, interference because, uh, for instance, the FBI in the United States have clearly looked at these types of, for instance, uh, Chinese police station, and have so far, according to the director uh, Christopher Ray of the FBI, in 2020, uh, the FBI arrested 16 uh, mostly Chinese uh, citizens operating in the United States on different charges as a result of their uh, investigations in the United States. So it is a concern, not solely for Canadians, but also looking at what's happening, for instance, in the United States. Uh, these things uh, are uh, very disturbing, to say the least. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I wonder, as you, as you say that then, and, and I, I take out what you're saying, that right now you do prefer these individual bodies like CSIS and the Committee of Parliamentarians to look into things that might be uh, sensitive in terms of security. How do you allow that to happen then, but at the same time inspire greater confidence amongst Canadians? What can be done right now to, to essentially calm Canadians who are concerned about the level of foreign interference? Well, uh, there are uh, a process and there needs to be uh, a certain level of transparencies for Canadians to be reassured 
about the elect electoral uh, process within our country. But there are some areas that would need to be uh, investigated with a little more uh, diligence. Uh, and, and, and of course, this aspect of the investigation needs to remain secret up to a certain point to allow the proper authorities to investigate these types of uh, foreign interference in our electoral process. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's anything that might be introduced in the interim that would help create that confidence right now? Well, the confidence of Canadians uh, is, of course, uh, the, the, in my opinion, the, 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 the strong basis for our electoral process. So uh, we need to reassure, you know, the government will need to reassure Canadians. But at the same time, uh, the proper uh, authorities will need to monitor uh, these types of interference just to ensure that Canadians are reassured. But also Canadian needs to be to understand and be educated on uh, the type of work that needs to be done because these are long protracted types of investigations and with not an, an easy solution uh, to actually satisfy the judicial process if need be uh, to bring in front of our Canadian justice certain individual that might have interfered in our electoral process. Pierre-Yves Baudois, thank you for this. Really appreciate the insight. My pleasure. Our profit is $1 on a $25 basket of groceries. Um, and if we invested 100% of our profits into lower prices, the price of a grocery basket would still be $24. Okay. Our profit levels are reasonable, um, and we are working hard to lower prices for Canadians in every way that we can. And the profit that we do generate, we reinvest back in this country uh, to create more stores, more services, and more jobs. Well, that was Galen Weston Jr., a familiar face to many Canadians as the CEO and the chairman of Loblaw Company Limited, appearing yesterday before the Agriculture Committee and made to explain really the exponential rise in food as many Canadians are struggling economically. But as you heard, Weston and his fellow CEOs at the committee argued they were not responsible for the rapid rise in food costs, in fact saying they barely made money and or lost money on certain food items. Well, for their reaction to the testimony, we're now joined by Ryan Turnbull. He is the Liberal MP for the riding of Whitby in Ontario. He sits on the Agriculture Committee. And Blake Desjardins, the NDP member for the Edmonton, for, excuse me, for the riding of Edmonton Griesbach. It is his party and his NDP colleague, Alistair McGregor, who proposed yesterday's hearing. Mr. Turnbull, Mr. Desjardins, thank you for joining us. Great to be here. Mr. Dejali, I'm going to get you to start us out here because your party has been accusing grocery chains of profiteering. Uh, we heard a very different story yesterday. Has it changed your assessment? No, it hasn't changed my assessment nor the assessment of the New Democratic Party. You know, it's clear that Canadians are experiencing some of the greatest cost of living crisis they've seen in maybe their lifetime, as certainly in a very long time. And food prices are one of the greatest indicators of that. The reality is people can't afford food in Canada. And we have the billionaires of the four, uh, some of the largest grocery chain companies in Canada present in the committee calling for empathy from Canadians for having what they call razor thin profits. We don't call them razor thin profits when they take home record, record levels of bonuses this year with the, on top of the fact that things like basic goods like chicken, $40. Families can't afford that. It's a serious problem growing in Canada. It needs to be addressed. And we need corporations to actually take this seriously. We need CEOs to finally take this seriously and realize that when they're taking huge sums of money, putting into bonuses, it hurts regular Canadians. Uh, Mr. Turnbull, what's your assessment? Uh, the hearing was supported uh, unanimously by all parties on your committee. What do you make of the testimony that you heard yesterday? Well, I think it was good to hear from the CEOs. Um, I think they were forthcoming with their answers. I think Canadians rightfully though have concerns about the corporate profits that they're seeing, which have uh, doubled across the food retail industry. And uh, I think uh, Canadians are skeptical uh, in the wake of the uh, press 
uh, bread price fixing scandal. And uh, I think the Competition Bureau has uh, been looking into this and uh, I was happy to hear uh, from Mr. Weston that they voluntarily have submitted their financial statements to the Competition Bureau. Mm -hmm. You know, Mr. Desjardins, if you listen to Mr. Weston and really even Mr. Uh, Lafleche from Metro, the bulk of their profits are coming from discretionary items like pharmaceuticals, cosmetics, fashion, not on food items. I, I, I hear what you're saying, but you know, when you, 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 you quote a $40 uh, price on, on chicken, for example, uh, Mr. Weston said that was a specialty item. All others were more competitive. Are, are, are these grocers being scapegoated for inflation that is beyond their control? No, they're certainly not being scapegoated. The reality is that these corporations, which aren't very many, are some of the most powerful CEOs in this country. They rake in billions of dollars. These, their net worths are in the billions. And the fact that we have any sympathy for the fact that single mothers can't afford to actually feed, they go hungry every single day in this country in order for their children to have a meal that day. I don't have any sympathy for the mega CEOs in this country that rake in record profits, the record-breaking profits that they've seen in the grocery sector. It's true that they may have, in fact, uh, profited off of other commodity goods. Like, for example, they've uh, seen some of the highest price profits from things like children's Tylenol. It's no secret to Albertans that seen some of the highest prices of children's Tylenol. As a matter of fact, we had a shortage of children's Tylenol. And guess how much these families had to pay for that? A necessary good for them, a necessary need of medicine for them, and they got price gouged. And that's what he's talking about when he says those other goods. We're talking about children's medicine. Uh, but again, supply, demand, there was a very short supply of it. Are you asking companies to subsidize Canadians to, to, to essentially uh, be almost a, a welfare player? No, that's not, that's not what we're saying at all. We're saying that we need to actually empower the institutions in this country that need to actually look after Canadians, particularly consumers. We have a competition bureau that can, in fact, do the work of making sure that consumers are protected. But the reality is we have a Liberal government right now here in Ottawa that is not doing the job of ensuring that the competition bureau has the teeth and has the ability to investigate these corporations in a good way. And look at the province of Alberta. We have a Conservative Premier there doubling down on the fact that these mega corporations in our province, in particular oil and gas, get even more uh, billions of dollars of taxpayer uh, money. And so we need to start thinking about Canadians. We need to start thinking about what the needs of regular folks are and actually have a government that supports these people. So, Mr. Turnbull, where does this go then? You know, if you hear Mr. Desjardins saying that the Competition Bureau, uh, which the, the grocery chains say they have handed over documents, we'll, we'll have to figure out or, or see where that goes. But if Mr. Desjardins says that Bureau does not have enough teeth, where does this go? Well, I think uh, our government has requested the study that they're undertaking in the first place. I think uh, we've also increased the resources to the Competition Bureau to do its job. I think it needs to do a thorough analysis. We know that food systems and, and the value chains that make them up are highly complex. And that's not to say that uh, we don't acknowledge that food retailers and our grocery giants have quite a lot of power in the market and I think we need to make sure that they're being fair uh, and transparent and that their behavior withstands uh, a pretty high standard that, that we expect and Canadians expect of our, uh, of our industries and I mean Canadians right now I mean I don't have empathy for uh, the grocery giants and their CEOs either I have empathy for Canadians and I think we need to consider all options uh, and the uh, Competition Bureau is just one action that our government is taking I think the grocery code of conduct uh, is another one that uh, we look forward to uh, seeing implemented in the near future okay well we continue to watch Ryan Turnbull Blake Desjardins thank you for the time tonight thank you very much Michael thank you now, we did invite the Conservatives to join our discussion. No MP was made available. And that is our show tonight, but we do have a closing note to share with you right now. The Prime Minister's office announcing that the U.S. President will make his state visit at the end of this month, March the 23rd to the 24th. Now, this will be Joe Biden's first visit to Canada since taking office as President. He will be accompanied by the U.S. First Lady, and he will also address Parliament. We will have full coverage of that state visit for you here on CPAC. Now, as for this evening, for everyone here at CPAC, thank you for joining us. I'm Michael Serapio. We'll see you again tomorrow night.